Hello, did you know that in biblical thinking, name equals authority, but name also equals fame? So, by obscuring the name of the Creator, Satan attempts to interfere with the Creator's authority, and Satan attempts to interfere with the Creator's fame. Let me show you. Jews have replaced the name of the Creator with Adonai, and even Hashem while Christians have replaced the Creator's name with Lord. And how about Pan, Zoti, Her, Uram, Shoda Prabhu in other languages? Can you see the confusion? Do you see the interference? Therefore, in this video series, we will focus on the original Hebrew name of the Creator, yod Hey wow Hey. Numerous topics and arguments will be investigated and tested against authentic Hebrew manuscript evidence. Thanks to Justin, my son, who prepared these topics and who will also be presenting these topics. My name is Piet van Rensburg. Please visit us at HebrewGospels.com. Hello everyone and welcome back to the series on Nehemia Gordon and the pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton yod Hey wow Hey. This is session number 9, part A of Nehemia's 10 Rabbis, Kabbalism and the Origin of the Vowel Points. So Nehemia did a study called 10 Rabbis that Speak Out on the Name. In this study Nehemia brings 16 Rabbis who talk about the name and he focuses on 10 of these and he calls this study 10 rabbis that speak it on the name. These rabbis talk about the name Yodeh Wahei, the vowels Shua, Cholom, Kamets, and all kinds of supposed secrets. And this is supposed to be definitive proof, undeniable proof that the name is Yehovah. In this two-part study we'll be investigating this topic of the 10 rabbis. Now before we evaluate how legitimate these 10 rabbis really are, we first need to look at the authority of the rabbis versus the authority of the Hebrew Bible manuscripts. Once we understand that, we can move on to the 10 rabbis. We'll get some background and we're going to look at these rabbis one by one to see why do they believe that Yehovah is a sacred name and why do they agree. And then today we'll do the first six rabbis, in the next session we'll do the other ten rabbis, and in the next session we also want to get to the vowel points. And we'll see that part of this misunderstanding of the name supposedly being Yehovi or Yehovah is that some people teach the vowel points come from Moses, including some rabbis. And so if Moses wrote Yehovi or Yehovah, then of course that's, those are sacred names. That's how some people think and they don't understand that these vowel points only record the traditional pronunciation of the name as Elohim and Adonai. So let's get started with point number one. The authority of the rabbis versus the authority of the Hebrew Bible manuscripts. So if we have these 10, 10 or 16 rabbis who say the name is Yehovah, should we just blindly follow these rabbis or should we carefully investigate the evidence to see what the truth is? Many people who come from a Christian background who now want to learn about the Hebrew, the Hebrew meanings of words, the Hebrew Torah, they think the rabbis know everything. The rabbis know Hebrew, they read the Bible in Hebrew, they have all these traditions, they know all the secrets and many people don't realize that the rabbis often teach things that are in opposition to the truth. Let's look at this quote from a Jewish book. It says, Even if the sages said to you concerning right that it is left, or concerning left that it is right, you must obey them willingly. Really? If they tell me right is left and left is right, I must obey them? This is unfortunately how arrogant the rabbinical system is. And this is not to say that every rabbi is arrogant, but the system is arrogant. Because the system teaches that the rabbis decide what is right and what is wrong. The rabbis decide what is true and what is false. In fact, they teach that the rabbis can change the truth. 
And so very often it's the rabbis versus truth. We can't just assume everything the rabbis say is truth. Let's look at this more detailed quote. Even if they tell you that right is left and that left is right, that is, even if it is obvious to you that the ruling of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, is not in accordance with the truth, in spite of this, heed them. Really? Yes, that's what they claim. For this is what the Blessed One decreed, supposedly, that we conduct ourselves according to their decisions, whether these decisions do or do not accord with the truth. So, we cannot just assume everything the rabbis teach is true. Very often, the rabbis teach things that are obviously not in accordance with the truth. Things that are obvious lies. And I believe that we should then follow the truth and not what the rabbis teach. Woe to these rabbis who think they can change the truth. Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Truth does not change. Let's look at some scripture. The works of his hands are truth and justice. Steadfast are all his ordinances. They stand fast forever for eternity. Psalm 33, the counsel of yod wah will stand forever. And Psalm 117, the truth of yod wah is forever. So I believe that if the rabbis teach us something that's obviously not in accordance with the truth, then we should follow the truth and not the rabbis. Okay, what is Nehemiah's view on the rabbis? Here's a quote from Nehemiah's book. The Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus, chapter 1, page 1, he says, My motto is, if it's not in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, I can't use it. So how is it that Nehemiah uses these 10 or 16 rabbis who are not in the Tanakh? He uses them as proof. Nehemiah Gordon is not actually living out his Karite motto. Okay, why does Nehemiah look at the rabbis? Why should we look at the writings of, of the rabbis if Nehemiah cannot use these sources? Nehemiah says, let's look at Jewish sources. When scholars ignore Jewish sources, we also learned why scholars ignore Jewish sources. While they scour every pagan and heathen source to discover the pronunciation of God's name. So I can understand the sentiment here. We don't want to look at pagan sources, magical sources, occult sources, mystic sources, all these pagan sources. We want to get back to kosher Jewish sources. That's the idea here. But what are we going to do if these Jewish sources tell us that right is left or that left is right? What are we going to do if these Jewish sources tell us something that's obviously not in accordance with the truth? Let's move on to some video clips of Nehemiah Gordon. Here you can see a video of Nehemiah Gordon where he says he does not believe it, the pronunciation Yehovah, to be true because the rabbis say it's true, but because it supposedly matches the evidence in the Hebrew Bible manuscripts. But, you know, hey, great minds think alike. I don't accept it because they say it. I accept it because it fits what I found in the Bible. Right. It, it, I mean, the Bible is the bottom line. Yeah. I want to see what evidence is and what, what it points to and follow that evidence. And the evidence we're finding both in Bible manuscripts and in the writings of rabbis is that the name is Yehovah. Hallelujah. Praise your holy it's, name, it's Yehovah. It's right there in black and white. So the claim is that the writing of the rabbis agree with the Bible manuscripts in saying the name is Yehovah. Nehemiah says he does not believe this because the rabbis say it. Well, then what are we going to do if what the rabbis say contradict the Bible manuscripts? What are we going to do? Here you can see Nehemiah Gordon saying that to him, one Bible manuscript means more than a million rabbis. Book. Manuscripts of the, of the Bible. Bible, of the Bible itself. And to me, one manuscript of the Bible written by the scribes who preserved the oracle of God are more important than a million rabbis. 
And to me, one manuscript of the Bible written by the scribes who preserved the oracle of God are more important than a million rabbis. Nehemiah's claim here is that to him, one Bible manuscript means more than a million rabbis. Is this maybe a slip of the tongue? No. Here's another video clip of Nehemiah Gordon where he says the same thing. And I say, okay, very interesting. I'm still going to base myself on the Bible manuscripts. For me, one Bible manuscript means more than a million rabbis. For me, one Bible manuscript means more than a million rabbis. So Nehemiah's claim here is that one Bible manuscript means more than a million rabbis. And I feel that rabbis cannot change the truth. Okay, so there are two ways to look at the Hebrew Bible manuscripts. You can either take the Aleppo Codex and say, there it is, black and white. Yehovi. There you have it. The name is Yehovi. No arguing. The rabbis can say what they want to. The name is Yehovi. That's a very dumb way of looking at the Bible manuscripts. And that's how Nehemiah looks at the Bible manuscripts. He says, there it is, Yehovi, black and white. Nehemiah ignores all the linguistic evidences in the Hebrew Bible. So if you haven't seen sessions number 6 and 7, be sure to watch them. In sessions number 6 and 7, I bring 8 proofs from the Masoretic Text. 8 clear indications from the Hebrew Bible manuscripts that say, No, the name is not Yehovah. These vowels, Shua, Cholom, Kamets, belong to Adonai. This is what the Hebrew Bible manuscripts say. And this is just a summary. We based every conclusion on the Hebrew Bible manuscripts. We looked at the Aleppo Codex, Cairo Codex, British Library 445, Leningrad Codex, Assun 507. We looked at the best manuscripts in the world. And the scribes told us by their pointings, no, the name is not Yehovah. By the way, these evidences occur many times. Evidence number one occurs more than 300 times in the Tanakh. Evidence number two occurs more than 690 times in the Tanakh. Evidence number three occurs 100 times in the Tanakh. The others occur less frequently, but you put all of this together, there's more than 1,100 indications in the Tanakh saying that Yehovah is a gibberish name, that these vowels, Shua, Chol, and Kamets, belong to Adonai. And so, if the rabbis want to tell us, no, Yehovah is a sacred name, whereas the Bible manuscripts say Yehovah is a gibberish name, then the rabbis are telling us that right is left, and that left is right. Then the rabbis are teaching us something that's obviously not in accordance with the truth. And so, in terms of manuscripts, the Leningrad Codex, which is a codex of the entire Tanakh, has nearly 1,000 pages in it. What does this mean? On average, the scribes tell us on every page, once every page, no, it's not Yehovah, no, it's not Yehovah, no, it's not Yehovah. On average, once every page of the Hebrew Bible. So, if these rabbis want to tell us that their manuscripts are wrong, then I'm telling you, the ten rabbis are wrong. No matter what their names are, when they lived, how many secrets they knew, if they want to contradict all the evidence in the Hebrew Bible manuscripts, it means they are wrong. And that is how simple it is. The rabbis cannot change the evidence in the Hebrew Bible manuscripts. Now this brings us to point number two. If these rabbis contradict the Tanakh, then why do they agree with each other? And why do they say that Yehovah is a sacred name? Before we answer this, by looking at the rabbis one by one, we first need to get some background. So we'll start here with the video clip of Nehemiah Gordon about rabbi number one. The first one I'm going to bring is from a book called the Tikkun Zohar. The first rabbi is in the Zohar. Now the Zohar is the key book of Kabbalah. And I have to tell you, as a Karite Jew, I'm very reticent to deal with Kabbalah. Kabbalah has symbolic meanings and explanations, and I tend towards the more literal contextual, what we call pshat. The symbolic meanings here are not concerned with the pshat. 
They want to take a verse out of context and defying the rules of language and find symbolic meaning in it. That's one of the main pursuits of Kabbalah. I don't accept these symbolic meanings. Wow, I don't understand this. Nehemiah's earliest Jewish source, which he lists as Rabbi number one, is a Kabbalistic book. And Nehemiah says that he does not believe in these Kabbalistic symbolic meanings. How could this be evidence of anything if Nehemiah doesn't believe in it? By the way, Nehemiah's explanation here of what Kabbalah is, is very euphemistic. And so what I want to show you is that Kabbalistic sources are not kosher Jewish sources. Why is this important? The whole idea of looking at the rabbis is we want to look at Jewish sources, Jewish sources, Jewish sources. We don't want to look at pagan sources, heathen sources, magical sources, occult sources, mystic sources. We want to look at kosher Jewish sources. So now I want to show you what Kabbalah is about. I want to show you that Kabbalah is not kosher Judaism. So here's a quote by a rabbi. He's a Kabbalistic rabbi, so he knows what he's talking about. And he says... Kabbalists take mainstream Judaism and mess with it. So if you're looking at a Kabbalistic source, that's Judaism that's been messed with. Let's read further. Expanding, contracting, adding to it, and twisting it in different ways to supposedly shed light on it. The Kabbalists very often start with the Bible. Then they take the Bible and they mess with it. They add to it, take away, they twist it. And then they think that they're shedding light on the Bible. So can you see here, Kabbalah is not kosher Judaism. So this quote is by Rabbi Benjamin Shalva. He is a rabbi, a writer, a yoga instructor, meditation teacher, and musician. Interesting. If you know what yoga and meditation is about then you'll know it comes from the East and Eastern pagan religions. And here it seems to be linked to Kabbalism. Interesting. Now, here is another definition from Webster's Dictionary more than 100 years ago. He says, Kabbalah is a kind of occult theosophy among Jewish rabbis. Oh, I see. They knew this more than a hundred years ago, that some rabbis believed in this occult theosophy called Kabbalah. Let's read further. Which treats on the nature of God and the mystery of human existence. It assumes that every letter, word, number and accent of the scripture contains a hidden sense. So very important. Every accent of the scripture. Also every vowel. The Kabbalists believe there are secret meanings in the pointings of the Hebrew Bible. And it, Kabbalah, teaches the methods of interpretation for ascertaining these occult meanings. So, I thought we're trying to get away from paganism. But it seems Kabbalah is quite pagan. Now, you might ask, are some Jews pagan? Isn't Jew the opposite of pagan? Well, let's read here from the Bible. And we're going to see that some Jews did very pagan things. Second Chronicles 33, But he, King Manasseh, did that which was evil in the sight of yod wah like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom yod wah had cast out before the children of Israel. So Manasseh made Judah, meaning the Jews, the inhabitants of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, and to do worse than the heathen, whom yod wah had destroyed before the children of Israel. So you can't just assume everything that the Jews do is going to be good. King Manasseh, a descendant of King David, who was a Jew, he was the king of Judah, he sacrificed his children to an idol. He appointed soothsayers and necromancers. He built altars to false gods, to idols. Oh, I see. It's Jewish to worship idols. No, it's not Jewish, it's pagan. We can't assume everything the Jews ever did is good. 
We can't make that assumption. So we can't assume everything that the rabbis say is going to be true either. What these rabbis say might very well be pagan. And especially if we read from Kabbalistic sources, they're giving us occult interpretations on the Bible. Now, here's another quote by a rabbi, and he says, The practical dimension of Kabbalah involves rituals for gaining and exercising power to effect change in our world and in the celestial worlds beyond ours. What do we call this in plain English? Magic. They won't call it magic, they're Jews. But they call this gaining and exercising power. If you want to do rituals, and in Kabbalah it's especially pronouncing sounds to gain and exercise power to change the world and the universe, that's magic. Can you see here, Kabbalah is not kosher Judaism, Kabbalah is actually quite pagan. The true master of this art fulfills the human potential to be a co-creator with God. That's the lie that Kabbalah has to sell. If you understand all these secrets and these occult meanings, then you will be like God. You'll be a co-creator with God. This sounds very familiar to me. Oh yes, it's in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Then the serpent said to the woman, Elohim knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Can you see here? It's the same lie that Satan is selling today in the form of Kabbalah. If you do this pagan stuff, then you're going to be like Elohim. You're going to be wise. Your eyes are going to be open. You'll understand all the secrets. It's the same lie that Satan sold to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, how widespread was this thing called Kabbalah or Kabbalism? Did many Jews believe in this or only a couple of Jews? Did many rabbis believe in this or only a couple of rabbis? You see, since the writing of this Zohar, Nehemiah quotes, in the 13th century, Many Jews believed in these Kabbalistic interpretations. And now we're going to look at some quotes here. This person, Pinchas Giller, says, Although Kabbalistic ideas may seem obscure and exotic to contemporary Western Jews, they were essential to normative Judaism until fairly recently. Now this doesn't make it right. We've already seen from Rabbi Benjamin Shalva he acknowledges that Kabbalah is really about twisting Judaism and messing with it. But this became normative Judaism in the Middle Ages. It actually became normal. Here's another Jewish book, and the author spends an entire chapter on this. Kabbalah is the official theology of the Jewish people. You won't find Kabbalah in the Tanakh. But... In extra-biblical writings and in the Middle Ages, it seems Kabbalah is the official theology of the Jewish people. So it won't be a surprise if we find some of these other rabbis' Nehemiah quotes might also be Kabbalistic. Here's another quote. Kabbalah is best described as the inner part of traditional Judaism. The early medieval Kabbalists wrote new mystical works culminating in the Kabbalistic Bible, the Zohar. Ah, so Nehemiah brings as rabbi number one Tikkunei Zohar, which is a, a section of the Zohar. And here we are told that the Zohar was the Kabbalistic Bible. It's not the Tanakh. It's not the true Bible. But the Kabbalists used this as if it were the Bible. So, the rabbis don't agree with the Bible manuscripts if they say Yehovah is a sacred name. The Bible manuscripts say, no, Yehovah is not a sacred name. Could it be that some of these rabbis agree with each other that the name is Yehovah, or that Yehovah is a sacred name because they learned from their Kabbalah Bible, from their Kabbalistic Bible, the Zohar? 
Here's another quote from the Jewish virtual library. The Zohar exercised so great a charm upon the Kabbalists that they could not believe for an instant that such a book could have been written by any mortal unless he had been inspired from above. And this being the case, it was to be placed on the same level with the Bible. Kabbalists believe in the divine inspiration of the Zohar, and they put this on the same level with the Bible. That's quite scary, isn't it? Because we've seen now that Kabbalah is about occult interpretations and magic. And again, you might say, does this mean some Jews are pagan? How could Jews be pagan? Let's just look at one more example from the Bible where we see that Jews have been pagan at times. So it talks here about Samaria and Sodom versus Jerusalem. Nehemiah is so negative toward the Samaritans who worship the idols. Now here it says, not only did you, Jerusalem, walk in their ways and do according to their abominations, within a very little time you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. Samaria has not committed half your sins. You, Jerusalem, have committed more abominations than they, and have made your sisters, Samaria and Sodom, appear righteous by all the abominations that you have committed. And so this is not to condemn all the Jews, but this is a warning. You can't assume that everything the Jews ever did is going to be good and right. You need to watch out for paganism. Watch out for paganism when you look at Jewish sources. Here's another quote from a Jewish website, safaria.org, and they say, The Zohar is the foundational work in the literature of Jewish mystical thought known as Kabbalah. Oh, so Nehemiah's earliest Jewish source is a mystical book. A mystical book. It is a group of books. So Tikkun Zohar, which Nehemiah quotes, is one of the books included under the heading Zohar, including commentary on the mystical aspects as well as material on mysticism, mythical cosmogony, and mystical psychology. So can you see, the Zohar is all about mysticism and myth. And now, this mysticism and myth becomes the earliest, most authentic Jewish source that Nehemiah brings to prove that the name is Yehovah. This is a Kabbalistic source. That's all about mysticism and myth. Okay, so now we've got some background. Now we want to look at these rabbis one by one. Now because the Zohar is the earliest of Nehemiah's rabbis, we need to pay attention here. And I want us to look at the Zohar in some detail. I want to show you what the Zohar really teaches. And I want to show you what the Zohar really claims. And so let's get into this. Rabbi number one, Tikkun Zohar. We'll go back to this video clip of Nehemiah Gordon, where he says that he does not believe in these symbolic interpretations. The first one I'm going to bring is from a book called the Tikkun Zohar. The first rabbi is in the Zohar. Now the Zohar is the key book of Kabbalah. And I have to tell you, as a Karite Jew, I'm very reticent to deal with Kabbalah. They want to take a verse out of context and defying the rules of language and find symbolic meaning in it. That's one of the main pursuits of Kabbalah. I don't accept these symbolic meanings. So can you believe Nehemiah starts out by saying that he does not accept these interpretations that we see in the Zohar. He tells us that it's the key book of Kabbalah. Okay. Here is a quote from Daniel Matt. He's an expert in the Zohar. He did an English translation plus a commentary on the main part of the Zohar. So he, know, he knows what this is about. And he says, I see the Zohar as a celebration of the imagination. An expert in the Zohar. It's even worse 
because this is mystic imagination and they present this to you as secrets. The Zohar gives many supposed secrets on various subjects and topics. And now you, as the reader, you're supposed to believe this mystic imagination as truth because it's supposedly a secret. Can you see the big problem here? This is all imagination. Now, imagination becomes proof that the name is Yehovah. Here is another video clip of Nehemiah Gordon where he ridicules Kabbalah and Kabbalistic ideas. I have to tell you, later rabbis under Kabbalistic influence came up with the idea that I can't even say the letters yud hey vav hey. I can't even pronounce those letters. But that's Kabbalah that starts to show up in the 12th and 13th century. But that's Kabbalah that starts to show up in the 12th and 13th century. But that's Kabbalah. It shows up in the 12th and 13th centuries. Does that sound familiar? The Zohar shows up in the 13th century. Interesting. Now, after we've seen that the Zohar is all about imagination and mysticism, and how that Nehemiah ridicules Kabbalistic ideas, and that he says he does not believe in these symbolic interpretations in the Zohar, now look at this clip of Nehemiah Gordon. He turns right around, and he claims that this Zohar is powerful. And what this passage in the Zohar means is that the vowels of the name are Yehovah. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's so powerful. And what this passage in the Zohar means is that the vowels of the name are Yehovah. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's so powerful. So now, this is powerful? How could this be powerful? This is mysticism. This is imagination. They're taking verses from the Bible here and they're taking them out of context. Let's just look at one phrase here. Only in your fathers did Yodewah He set his love. Deuteronomy 10.15. If you go back to Deuteronomy 10.15 and you read it in context, it's got nothing to do with pronouncing the name a certain way. Nothing. Okay, they're taking this out of context and they're giving you their imaginary mystical interpretation and now this is powerful. Really? Does Nehemiah believe in Kabbalah? The Kabbalists certainly believe that there's power in the Zohar. How does this work? Karaites do not believe in Kabbalah. They don't believe that these Kabbalistic interpretations are powerful. How does this work? Okay, now we want to look at the Zohar, and especially Tikkunei Zohar. And I want to show you the confusion that there is about the name in Tikkunei Zohar. So this is Tikkunei Zohar HaKadma, the introductory part of the Zohar, but it's not a modern introduction, it's part of the Zohar. And it says this, Rabbi Shimon went and escaped to the wilderness. He and his son, Rabbi Eliezer, hid in a cave. Eliyahu the prophet would come to them twice every day and teach them. Now just keep in mind, this is a celebration of the imagination, okay? This never happened. But this is the claim, and this is the supposed authenticity that the Zohar has. This is supposedly a revelation from the Creator to Shimon Bar Yochai via Eliyahu the Prophet. That's the claim. Okay? Now, pay attention. And supernal above everything gave permission to all the holy names and all the Havayot. What in the world is Havayot? It's the plural form of the singular Havaya. What is Avaya? Oh, it's Kabbalah. They decided you can't say yod hey vav hey yod hey wah hey in that order. You can't write it in that order if you're not in the Bible, unless you're writing a Bible manuscript. So they changed the order and they write hey vav yod hey havaya. Oh, that's what Nehemiah just ridiculed. That's Kabbalah that shows up in the 12th and 13th centuries. That's what the Zohar is about. And take note, it's in the plural, Havayot, Tetragrammatons. According to the Zohar, according to Tikkunei Zohar, there are multiple pronunciations of the Tetragrammaton. And today we want to focus on two of these, Yehovi and Yehovah. 
with Elohim and Adonai's vowels. Both these pronunciations are in the Zahar, in Tikkun Zahar. Let's read further. And to all the nicknames to reveal to them the concealed secrets, plural, each name on its level. We're going to see today that in Kabbalism, they believe in these, what they call the 50 gates of insight. And you have these different gates and different levels and different pronunciations of the name for the different levels. The Zohar does not even claim. It does not even claim to give you the one original correct pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton. It gives multiple pronunciations based on this Kabbalistic superstition. Okay, if you still don't believe me that this is about magic, look at this, an English translation of Tikkunei Zohar, Sefer Tikkunei HaZohar, the book of the Tikkunei of the Zohar. The author calls himself the chief magician of mystery Babylon. Can you see how blatant this is? This is about magic. And they want to use different pronunciations of the name to act out different forces to change the world. And I'm going to show this to you very clearly in Tikkun Zohar. But before we go there, it's necessary for you to understand that the Zohar is a fraud. And what do I mean? The Zohar was written in the 13th century, okay? Even Nehemiah says it was written around the year 1300. However, on the inside, the Zohar claims to have been written in the 2nd century by the son of Shimon Bar Yochai. A thousand years, more than a thousand years earlier. It's a fraud. I recommend to you Ginsberg's book, The Kabbalah, written 100 years ago, or published 100 years ago. He lists 13 reasons why the Zohar could not possibly have been written by Shimon Bar Yochai's son, and he proves that it was invented as a forgery in the 13th century. So not only is this an occult book, about magic, mysticism, and myth based on the imagination, but this is a fraud. It's a lie. So if the Zohar is supernaturally inspired, may I ask, who inspired the Zohar? The father of lies, because it's a lie. Not only do scholars know this, here is a Jewish rabbi who challenges and denies the authenticity of the Zohar. Although many rabbis believe in the Zohar, this rabbi did his homework and he says that the Zohar is erroneous and he even calls the Zohar blasphemous. Blasphemous? Yes. For example, the Zohar takes the verse saying, All your males shall appear before Yodei Wahei three times the year. They take that verse and apply this to Shimon Bar Yochai. Now he becomes Yodei Wahei, supposedly, and everyone must appear before Shimon Bar Yochai three times in the year putting him on the same level with yod hey wow hey with the Creator. It's blasphemous. Now, let me just show you an example of blasphemy here in Tikkun Zohar, in Tikkun number 70. So Nehemiah's quote about Chashak and the secret of the vowels of the name comes from Tikkun number 70. So here we are in Tikkun number 70 in the context of the secret of Because He Loves Me. And that key word there, Chashak, we'll get into that in detail later today. Uh, so they're quoting the Bible here, Because he loves me, I will deliver him. And then they quote another verse from the Bible, And Yodei Wahei will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yodei Wahei will be one and his name one. You see how they get people to believe this? They quote passages from the Bible all the time. Now, take notice, they're going to twist this and mess with it. And Yodei Wahei will be father and mother. Yodei Wahei will be one and his name one. There you have it from the Zohar. Yodei Wahei is mother and her name is Yehovah. Now this becomes evidence that the name is Yehovah. I mean, this is blasphemous. This is from the exact same section Nehemiah quotes to prove the name is Yehovah. I don't understand how this could be seen as evidence. This is evidence that Yehovah is an occult, a Kabbalistic, a mystic pronunciation of the name. Associated here with blasphemy, calling Yodei Wahei mother. Okay, now we want to go back to Tikkun Zohar, Tikkun 69. We want to get some context here. We want to see where does all this stuff come from. 
Um, what is Chashak? Where does it come from? In the Chemia's little quotation from the Zohar, you will think, oh, it looks all good. We have a secret and we have Bible verses. And the Chemia even says it's powerful. The Chemia doesn't show you the blasphemy there in the same chapter. So now we want to go back to Tikkun Ezer, Tikkun 69. We want to get some context. We want to see where does this Chashak thing come from? And I also want to show you the Zohar gives multiple pronunciations of the name. And just before we do this, here's a warning. Deuteronomy 4, you must not add unto the word which I'm commanding you, and you must not take away from it. Deuteronomy 12, every word which I'm commanding you, you must keep by doing it. You must not add unto it and not take away from it. When we read here in the Zohar, you're going to see how they add and take away from the word, and how they make a mess of it. Proverbs 30, do not add unto his words, lest he rebuke you and you prove yourself to be a liar. The Zohar proves to be a lie because it messes with the word. It adds to the word. So here we go. Tikkun Zohar, Tikkun 69. And this is my straight translation from Aramaic. It might be overly literal, but I'll explain to you what it means and what they're trying to say here. And I want you to notice the mysticism here. I want to see what Chashak is. This key word that they use to say Yehovah is a sacred name. It says here, Behold, fire came out from the heart, spirit from the wings of the lung, from the brain, waters. When the spirit is united with the water and the fire, a sound or a voice is made. Now, just when you start thinking, this is nonsense, then they start quoting the Bible. When it is united with the water, it is said, and then they quote Psalm 29, the voice of Yodeh is on the waters. Now, in the Tikkun Zohar, they take this phrase, the voice of Yodeh is on the waters, and they make voice mean sound. We have the same Hebrew word for voice and sound, the same Aramaic word for voice and sound. Okay, so now voice becomes sound, the sound of Yodeh on the waters. When it is united with the fire, it is said, the voice of Yodeh cuts out flames. Now take note, originally the voice of Yodeh is with power and it cuts out flames. Now they want this to mean the sound of Yodeh The sound of Yodeh pronounced with a certain set of vowels, cuts out flames. That's what they're hinting at, and it becomes even clearer if we go down further. When it is united with spirit, now you've got the third vowel there, so they're actually talking about three vowels, as we'll see in a minute. When you have all three vowels there, it is a mighty wind, tore mountains apart and shattered rocks. So again, they're quoting from the Bible, and upon that the voice of Yodeh Wahe was spoken, breaking cedars. So again, the voice of Yodewahe breaks cedars, but they make this mean the sound of Yodewahe breaks cedars. And these three vowels correspond to Emesh, which stands for fire, water, and heavens, and they are Chashak. This is what Chashak is about. It's about all this mysticism and taking the Bible out of context. Now, let's read further on the next page. It's going to become very clear that they're using this pronunciation, Yehovah, as some kind of a sacred name to act out power, to do magic, to change the world. It's going to become very clear here. Excuse the small font, but I want you to see the link between Chashak and the conclusion at the bottom. And this is what is written. Only in your fathers did Yodeh Wahei Chashak, which they turn into an acronym, they make it Chashak, and these are Cholem Shva. Comets. Now let's just pause there and explain. In the Hebrew Bible, it uses the word chashak and means he loved or he delighted in. Now, here in the Zohar, they take this out of context and they turn chashak into chashak, which is now an acronym standing for three words. It never meant that in the Bible. Okay, but they make this mean chashak, which is an acronym for cholem shva comets. Now, can you see that's in the wrong order? In Yehovah, it's Shua Cholom Kamet. But here, in the acronym form, because they're trying to link this to a word in the Bible, it's in the wrong order, because the Ch there in Chashak becomes the Cholom, the Sh there in Chashak becomes the Shua, 
The K there in Khashak becomes the Comet. And it's in the wrong order. Why? Because this is imagination. This is not true. It's not true. It's imagination. And this reminds me of something that we saw in video number one. Nehemiah Gordon reads and writes Hebrew in the wrong direction to make the name Yehovah. That's what the Kabbalists do. It's imagination. Okay, now they're going to explain what this is all about. Comets as the right hand. What does that mean? In Yehovah, the comet is not on the right hand side, it's on the left hand side. So what does that mean? It means power. Right hand in the Hebrew Bible means power, might, strength, force, ability. They're hinting here that there's power in the comets, supposedly, okay? But this is how the Kabbalists think. And then they quote, the voice of Yodeh wah hey, on the waters. And when the spirit is united with it, which is Cholam. Now that's very important, because when we get to the pronunciation Yehovi, they're just going to say spirit. They've already told you that spirit, in, you know, in this superstitious interpretation here, yeah, the spirit is the Cholam. And then they quote the Bible. It is said, and the spirit of Elohim hovered on the waters, Shua is with fire, and when the spirit is united with it, so you have all three vowels together, it is a mighty wind, tall mountains apart, and shattered rocks, on the side of power, which is mighty, when the spirit is united with it, which is Cholam, between the comets and the Shua, which are water and fire, which are the two arms. And again, what does that mean, two arms? Arm, in Hebrew and Aramaic, means force or might. In whom are the right hand and the left hand. And now we're getting to the climax here of this particular pronunciation. In Tikkun 69, it says, which are 28 chapters. What does that mean? They're hinting at something. They give the answer in the next line, which is said of them, the voice of Yodei Wahe is with power. The Hebrew word here for power is koach. 28 is written here with kaf chet, the same consonants we have here for power. They're not so much trying to say 28, they're trying to say power. Originally, in the Bible, the voice of Yodei Wahe is with power, means that when the Creator speaks, it's with power. The Kabbalists take that and they apply this to themselves. They make themselves equal to Yodei Wahe. They say, if we can only pronounce the sound, of Yodeh Bahe, it's with power. Now, that's not all. Chapters there in Aramaic is Pirkin, and the root is Peresh Kof. It's the same root used up here for tearing mountains apart. So the Zohar is written as a secret. You need to put two and two together to get what they're talking about. And what this passage in the Zohar means is that if you pronounce the name as Yehovah, that sound is as power in it. It's powerful, supposedly. And this tears mountains apart. It shatters rocks. In the previous slide, it breaks cedars. Not only that, Kafchet stands as an acronym for Keter Chochmah, Crown of Wisdom. Supposedly, if you know the secret, you're going to have the power of Yodei Wahei's voice for yourself. Okay? And you're going to be wise. Isn't that what Rabbi Jeffrey said? The practical dimension of Kabbalah involves rituals, which is very often pronouncing certain sounds, for gaining and exercising power to effect change in our world and in the celestial worlds beyond ours. The true master of this art fulfills the human potential to be a co-creator with God. That is what the pronunciation Yehovah is about in the Zohar. It's saying you can have the power of Yodei Wahei if you pronounce the name a certain way. It's about magic. That's what it is about. No wonder Nehemiah says it's powerful. And what this passage in the Zohar means is that the vowels of the name are Yehovah. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's so powerful. And what this passage in the Zohar means is that the vowels of the name are Yehovah. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's so powerful. 
So can you believe Nehemiah Gordon goes along with this story that there's power here in the Zohar and in the secret of Chashak? He claims that he does not believe in the Zohar. But by saying it's powerful, he shows that he does believe in the Zohar. And he does believe in all this nonsense that says it's powerful if you pronounce the name as Yehovah. Now we want to go back to Tikkun Zohar, Tikkun 69, the same section but further down. And they give us multiple pronunciations of the Tetragrammaton. We're going to skip down to the end here when they get to the pronunciation Yehovi. It says here, the voice of Yodei Wahe causes the wilderness to tremble. Again, a quote from Psalm 29. And then they say, that is Hirak, and that is righteous. When the spirit is in it, it makes the wilderness to tremble. Seven sounds, or seven voices, they're still hinting at this voice sound thing, corresponding to the seven names. So this is almost like a little conclusion here. They're giving you multiple pronunciations of the name, and the one they're giving you here is with a chirek, which is an E, the E of Yehovi. The spirit is the cholam. They've already talked about the schwa. They don't have to repeat it here. Yehovi is supposedly righteous, and it supposedly makes the wilderness tremble. And can you see here? Seven sounds, seven voices, seven names. The Zohar doesn't even claim to give you the one original pronunciation. They're giving you magic words with which you can supposedly do different things. Yehovah supposedly is powerful, and Yehovi supposedly is righteous. And to show this to you very clearly, we're going to look at another passage from Tikkun Zohar, which again talks about the pronunciation Yehovi. Tikkun Zohar Hakadma, the introductory part. It says, because he loves me, I will deliver him. And again, love here is Chashak, and they turn this into Chashak as an acronym. Open for me the gates of righteousness. Now that's very important. Gates of righteousness. The Kabbalists have very weird ideas about these different gates. And I want to enter by them. I will praise Yod Hey. That section there is not actually quoted in the Zohar. Again, it's written as a secret. You need to know the verse and know the next uh, phrase says, I will praise yod heh wah -Hey. And that's the key there. They're talking about the name yod heh wah -Hey. And some kind of a secret here about the vowels. Because he loves me, again, that's chashak, I will deliver him. And then it says you're in the Zohar, in so many words. Chashak is chirak, shva, comets. What's the comets doing there? And then they say this, comets, comets. What is this? This is imagination. But let me explain to you what they're doing here. The names of the vowels are very interesting because in Chirek, the first vowel in Chirek is an E, and that's the vowel, Chirek. In Shua, the first vowel is an E in modern Hebrew. In comets, the first vowel is an A. But in comets, the first vowel is an O. Can you see here? We've got E, E, and O. And again, just like Chashak, Cholam Shva Kamets are in the wrong order, again, Chirek Shva Kamets is in the wrong order, but these are the vowels Ye, Ho, V, E, O, E. They're in the wrong order because there's imagination, but it talks here about the pronunciation Yehovi in Tikkun Zahar. So I could just as well take this, if I'm like Nehemiah Gordon, I could take this passage and say, there you see, I've got evidence the name is Yehovi, evidence from a Jewish source here, Tikkun Zahar. No, this is not evidence. This is superstition. This is Kabbalah. This is imagination. Now, I want to show you more rabbis who say the name is Yehovi. More rabbis. Here's Rabbi Moshe Maram al -Sheikh. He's a Kabbalistic rabbi. So remember, the Zohar is the Bible of the Kabbalists. The Bible of the Kabbalists. And he says, however, the name yod heh which is also pointed with the vowels of Elohim, so the vowels Yehovi, is for the world to come. 
Really? We're going to see later today how that Nehemiah quotes a rabbi saying, In the world to come, we're going to say Yehovah. Here we have a rabbi saying, In the world to come, we're going to say Yehovi. This is Kabbalah nonsense, and it comes from the Zohar. And now what these later rabbis do is they add to it. The Zohar didn't say, In the world to come, it's going to be Yehovi. But they get this idea from the Zohar, add to it, contract, mess with it, you know, they do their Kabbalism with it. And there you have it, the name is Yehovi, in the world to come. He quotes yet another person saying, Behold, there are two aspects, one related to this world, and it is Adonai, and the second to the coming world, and this is yod wah with the vows of Elohim, Yehovi. Here's another rabbi, Rabbi Abraham, ben Rabbi Jacob Saba, he says, Let me explain. The rabbis are going to explain this to us now. He began with Adonai, for this is the established place to plead for grace, and this is the gate to enter by. So, can you see these Kabbalists have all kinds of weird ideas about these gates, and you use the different names to go through the different gates, supposedly. And Yehovi and Yehovah are just two of multiple pronunciations of the Tetragrammaton that they use for certain of these gates. Let's read further. And after it entered the gate of heavens, it went up to the gates of repentance, which is Yodewahe with the vowels of Elohim. And this is based on the Zohar saying, Open for me the gates of righteousness, I want to enter by them. Chashak is Chereksva Kormetz, Yehovi. They're basing it on the Zohar. Repentance and righteousness go together in the Bible. We know that. So this. Gates of repentance seems to be a synonym of gates of righteousness, and they want to use Yehovi as a magic word to get through that gate. And this is Hashem Elohim you have begun, for the name is the beginning of everything. The Kabbalists believe they do everything with names and sounds. If you know how to use the names, you can do anything. You can have power, you can have righteousness, wisdom, everything. They believe all their power is in the names that they use. Okay, one last quote by Rabbi Moshe Maram al -Sheikh. He says, The name of Adanut, for by them you opened my lips, etc. Now this is important for today. The name of Adanut means Adonai. This rabbi is referring to a verse in the Psalms. And this verse says, Adonai, you have opened my lips. Now, why do they call this the name of Adonut? Because they use Adonai as a name. And some rabbis actually call Adonai a name. But it means Lord, literally my lords. And so they call this the name of Adonut, meaning the name of lordship. If you're reading in Jewish writings, the name of lordship means Adonai. Okay? And this is the entrance of the gate of prayer. You see the this rabbi is also on this topic of the gates, and he used different names for the different gates, supposedly. It, Adonai, brings it and takes it up in such a way that it reaches. And it tells you, where is your prayer going to reach if you pray in Adonai's name? Which is less than Elohim, for it reaches unto the 49th of the 50 gates of insight. There you can see, 50 gates of insight. When that measure is related to this name of yod -Heh, with the vowels of Elohim. What this means is, Yehovi takes your prayer to the 49th of the 50 gates, based on this Kabbalistic superstition. Now, I've shown you three rabbis saying it's Yehovi. Tikkun Zahar, Rabbi Moshe Maram Ashlech, and Rabbi Abraham ben Re Rabbi Jacob Saba. Is this good evidence? To say the name is Yehovi? No. This all traces back to this fraudulent, occult, blasphemous book called Tikkun Zohar. And these later Kabbalistic rabbis, they're just basing their thinking on the Zohar. And these sources we've just looked at are not kosher Jewish sources. They are pagan Jewish sources. They're Kabbalistic Jewish sources. We cannot use these to say the name is Yehovi. Okay, so here's the summary of Rabbi number one, Tikkun Ezer. It's the Bible of Jewish occultism or mysticism called Kabbalah. It's a fraudulent, falsified book. 
and it uses this keyword Chashak both for Yehovi and Yehovah. Nehemiah doesn't tell you that. He doesn't want you to know that. The Zohar says the name is Yehovi and Yehovah at the same time. The Zohar gives multiple pronunciations of the Tetragrammaton as magic words. Yehovi supposedly gives you righteousness and Yehovah supposedly gives you power and wisdom. So, we've clearly seen here that Tikkunei Zohar, which Nehemiah lists as Rabbi number one, is a Kabbalistic book. In other words, it's not a kosher Jewish source. It's about mysticism, imagination, myth. It's even got blasphemy in it. Now, how about Rabbi number two, Menachem Tzioni? Was he a Kabbalistic rabbi? Did he base his thinking on the Kabbalistic Bible, the Zohar? Or is he an independent source saying the name is Yehovah? Let's see. So we'll start here with the Jewish Encyclopedia. It says that Menachem Tzioni was a Kabbalist of the middle of the 15th century. He was the author of the Kabbalistic commentary Tzioni from which he derives his name. Okay, so he was a Kabbalist and he wrote a Kabbalistic commentary. The Zohar is the Bible for the Kabbalistic rabbis. So we should not be too shocked if this rabbi agrees with his Kabbalistic Bible in saying that Yehovah is a sacred name. It's not going to be a big surprise. So let's move on to a video clip of Nehemiah Gordon on rabbi number two. He goes on Menachem Sioni. He says, the rule of the secret is, and he quotes the same verse of the Zohar, and he quotes the same verse of the Zohar, only in your fathers did Yehovah set his love. And again, love there is Chashak. So Menachem Sioni brings two acronyms, Chashak and Shachak. Okay, so it's important to note what Nehemiah says. Menachem Sioni brings a new acronym here. Chashak comes from the Zohar. Now he adds this new acronym, Shachak. So this is also a Kabbalistic keyword here that they use to refer to the vowel Shua Cholom Kamets on the name. Okay, what did this rabbi say? The rule of his secret is, and then he quotes the same verse as the Zohar. Like I said, this phrase here, Deuteronomy 10.15, in the Bible has nothing to do with the name yod and how you pronounce it. This comes from the Kabbalistic Bible. The Kabbalistic Rabbi Menachem Tzioni bases his thinking on the Kabbalistic Bible, the Zohar. And he tells us that this is the rule of his secret. Even though he tells you in many different ways that Shua Cholom Kamets, he bases his thinking on the Zohar, the Kabbalistic Bible, the fraudulent, blasphemous occult book called the Zohar. Okay, now look at this video clip of Nehemiah Gordon. So, Shva Cholam Kamatz Yehovah. And look, I could stop here. I have two witnesses. I mean, it's right there in black and white. I really could have stopped here. I have two witnesses, right? Two witnesses? Now, what happened to the million rabbis? And by the way, it's not difficult to find two false witnesses who agree with each other. We have here two Kabbalistic sources. Why do they agree? Because the second one bases his thinking on the first one. We have two Kabbalistic sources, two sources that mess with the Bible. Now these are the two witnesses saying the name is Yehovah. These are not two very good witnesses. By the way, this manuscript on the screen is not a manuscript of the Tanakh. It's in Hebrew? Yes. It's a manuscript? Yes. It's a manuscript of Kabbalah. It messes with the Bible. It's not the Bible. The rabbis are telling us that right is left and left is right. They're contradicting all the evidence in the Hebrew Bible. So, rabbi number two simply agrees with his Kabbalistic Bible in saying that Yehovah is a sacred name. And then he builds on that. He adds new acronyms and different ways to remember this. Okay, so rabbi number two, shockingly, he's a Kabbalist too. The first two rabbis are Kabbalistic. I thought we were trying to get away from mysticism, occultism, paganism, magic. Now we're right back into this. 
How about Rebbe number three, Shabbatai Sofer? Was he Kabbalistic? Did he base his thinking on Kabbalistic sources or on facts? And again, let's start with the video clip of Nehemiah Gordon. Rabbi number three is very different from the first two. The first two rabbis are Kabbalists. Rabbi number three is the greatest grammarian of the 17th century. Rabbi number three is very different from the first two. The first two rabbis are Kabbalists. Rabbi number three is the greatest grammarian of the 17th century. So Nehemiah wants you to think that Rabbi number three as a grammarian based this claim that the name is Yehovah on grammar and not on Kabbalah like the first two rabbis. That's the claim here. That's what Nehemiah teaches. Let's dig a little bit deeper. And we'll start here with the Jewish Encyclopedia. It says, Shabbatai ben Isaac, who was surnamed Sofer and Medakdek, was a teacher of the Talmudist and Kabbalist Chaim Bochner. Oh, so he taught and educated another Kabbalist. Interesting. He left in manuscript on the obligation of studying grammar demonstrated from the Targum, etc., etc., and from the Zohar. There you have it. He used the Zohar to demonstrate his grammar. How can you call that grammar? I mean, the Zohar gives you everything in the wrong direction. That's not grammar. Sefer Yetzirah. He demonstrates grammar from Sefer Yetzirah. That's a Kabbalistic book and other Kabbalistic works. Anyone basing their grammar on Kabbalah, their grammar is not going to be very trustworthy. Okay, they even read stuff in the wrong direction. Go back to video number one. Nehemiah also does that, and he calls it grammar. That's the Kabbalistic definition of grammar. You take something, you mess with it, you use your imagination, and it becomes evidence. That's how Kabbalistic grammar works. Okay. Let's go back to a video clip of Nehemiah Gordon on Rabbi number three. And he says, and behold, when it is read as yud heh vav -Hey, in the world to come, then its vowels will be shachak. <laughs> Woo <laughs> Amazing. It's so powerful. Amazing. It's so powerful. How could Nehemiah say this is powerful? Look at the key word there. It's Shachak. The key word there is the acronym that the Kabbalist Menachem Tioni brought. He added this to Chashak, which comes from the Zohar. This is a Kabbalistic acronym. And again, Nehemiah seems to say that this Kabbalism is powerful and amazing. Now, I've already shown you a rabbi saying, in the world to come, we're going to say Yehovi. What evidence is this? Nehemiah makes you think, this is evidence. He cheers and he shouts and he's so excited. In the world to come, we're going to say Yehovah. Well, I've already shown you another rabbi saying, in the world to come, we're going to say Yehovah. Kabbalistic rabbis are not evidence of the true name of Yehovah. Hey. They're simply following this fraudulent book called the Zohar. Okay. Furthermore, Rabbi number three quotes Menachem Tzioni verbatim. He says, Tzioni wrote, and then he quotes him, The vowels of the name are with the vowels of Le'olam, of which the sign is Shachak, Shvach Olam Kametz. Where do I get this from? From the exact same letter Nehemiah quotes from. So here you can see it in book form. Originally, this was a letter that Rabbi number three wrote to Rabbi number four. Okay? Then they took this and they printed it in book form. And so what Nehemiah quotes is over here, And behold, when it is read with yod He or as yod he in the world to come, as nekudotav shachak, then its vowels will be shachak. That's what Nehemiah quotes. Just go up to the top of the slide and he's quoting Menachem Tzioni. Rabbi number two is a Kabbalist. There you can see he's quoting Tzioni. Okay, so let's start there with the blue. Shekatava Tzioni, Zeleshano, which Tzioni wrote, this is what it says, Nikud Hashem Hu, the pointing of the name is, Benikud Leolam, with the pointing of Leolam, Shesimino Shachak, of which the sign is Shachak. Can you see where Rabbi number three gets Shachak from? 
from rabbi number two. He's quoting rabbi number two. Rabbi number two says the rule of the secret is Chashak, and that comes straight from the Zohar. All of this traces back to the Zohar. Now, if you read further on that previous page, you'll see that Rabbi number three talks about the composite Shua versus the simple Shua. And why don't we put a composite Shua on the name for Adonai? And if we don't have a composite Shua on the name, it means it's not the vows of Adonai and this kind of stuff. And maybe that's what Nehemiah refers to when he talks about grammar. So, go back to video number four. In the best manuscripts in the world, this is how grammar works. When you put Adonai or Elohim's vowels on the name, you change the composite Shua of Elohim or the composite Shua of Adonai into a simple Shua. Okay, so Rabbi number three, Shabbatai Sofer, was Kabbalistic and he bases his thinking on the writings of Rabbi number two, Menachem Tzioni, which in turn bases his thinking on Tikkunei Zohar, Rabbi number one. You see, these are not independent sources. They're just following each other. And ultimately, they're following a blasphemous, fraudulent book called Tikkunei Zohar. How about Rabbi number four, Mer Maram of Lublin? Was he Kabbalistic? Did he base his thinking on Kabbalah or on factual evidence? Let's see. The Jewish Encyclopedia states that Lublin paid little heed to the Kabbalah, doesn't say he rejected it, though it is evident from his response on number 34 that he believed in the sacredness of the Zohar. Okay, if you believe in the sacredness of the Zohar, you believe it's divinely inspired, and you know anything about the teachings of Tikkun Zohar and Chashak, then you'll know about the supposed secret of the name being Yehovah. Okay, so maybe Rabbi number four also based his thinking on the Zohar, on the Kabbalistic Bible, because he believed it was a sacred book. So now we're going to look at a video clip of Nehemiah Gordon on Rabbi number four. And so Rabbi number four responds to Rabbi number three. And he quotes Rabbi number five and Rabbi number six. And all of this in an attempt to refute Rabbi number three's supposed grammar saying that Shua Cholom Kamets can't be the vowels of Adonai because it's with a simple Shua. So this is meant to be a refutation to the supposed grammar of Rabbi number three. He begins his letter to Shabtai Sofer. He says, No, my beloved, how extremely difficult it is to put things like this in writing. And even more so a letter sent about from place to place concerning the vowels of the Tetragrammaton, which are Shva, Cholam Kamatz. It's right there. There it is. He's telling you what the vowels are. And he's telling you it's difficult to put this in writing. What if someone intercepts this letter and finds out the vowels of Shvach Cholam Kamatz? And that I, as a rabbi, have this information that's been transmitted to me. We're not supposed to make this public. <laughs> it's amazing that we can see these things today. Okay, sounds all good. But what I want to show you is, you see those three dots there? shows Nehemiah shortened up the quote and then the next word they're concerning is in square brackets means Nehemiah added that I want to show you how far removed this opening sentence is from that second phrase Nehemiah adds down at the bottom okay excuse the small font that's how far removed these two phrases are that first red part at the top right corner is know my beloved how extremely difficult it is for me to put things like this in writing etc etc then the Chemia skips these lines and lines and lines and lines and lines of argumentation in which rabbi number four refutes rabbi number three and he tells him look shwa cholam kamets are the vowels of adonai and then finally he says with the vowels of the name of four meaning the vowels of the tetragrammaton which is, or which are, Shwa Cholam Kamets. Okay, so we know they put Adonai's vowels on the name as Shwa Cholam Kamets. He's not saying it's so difficult to put in writing Shwa Cholam Kamets. These two phrases are very far removed in the actual response that this rabbi wrote. Now, look at those two ovals. I wanted to zoom in on that phrase. Before this rabbi says the vowels of the name 
of the Tetragrammaton, which are Shua Cholom comments, he first makes it very clear what he's talking about. And so he's again quoting another source. He says, and so he wrote in chapter 4 that the pointing of the Tetragrammaton is according to the pointing of the name of Adonut, meaning Adonai, Shua Cholom Kamets. Before this rabbi says the name of the vowels of the Tetragrammaton, which are Shua Cholom Kamets, he first specifies what he's talking about. You point the Tetragrammaton according to Adonai with Shua Cholom Kamets. Nehemiah doesn't show you this because he doesn't want you to know this. He wants you to think this rabbi agrees with him. But really, this rabbi does not agree with Nehemiah Gordon. This rabbi says we've got the same vowels on the name as we have on Adonai. This rabbi number four, Maram of Lublin, uses Chashak. He says here, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Who's that? That's the person who supposedly wrote the Zohar. He says, in Tikunim. What is that? That's Tikune Zohar. Tikunim is the absolute form, plural Tikunim, and then becomes Tikune, the Tikunim of the Zohar. That the Tetragrammaton is with the pointing Shwa Cholom Kamets and is called Chashak. Can you see here, Rabbi number four, bases his thinking on the Kabbalistic Bible, the Zohar, which is written in the name of Shimon Bar Yochai. He tells you, this comes from Tikunim, from Tikunei Zohar. So this is again, it's not an independent source, this is another rabbi following Tikunei Zohar. Can you believe it? Rabbi number four is Kabbalistic, and he bases his thinking on Kabbalistic sources. He quotes, uh, refers to Tikunei Zohar, and he actually knows that they're putting Adonai's vowels on the name. They're putting the same vowels on the name than they have on Adonai. You see, this is how the Kabbalists make their sacred names. You take your day, well, hey, sacred consonants. Then you take Adonai's vowels, sacred vowels, and put them on the name. Or you take Elohim's vowels and put them on the name. And then you make your sacred names, Yehovi and Yehovah. It's imagination and it's Kabbalah. This is not proof that the name is Yehovah. This rabbi bases his thinking on Kabbalistic sources, including Tikkunei Zohar. Okay, rabbi number five, Asher Lemel of Krakow in the 16th century. Was he Kabbalistic? Did he simply follow his Kabbalistic Bible? Or is he an independent source here, saying the name is Yehovah? Let's see. Here is a tombstone inscription. This is what they write on Asher Lemel's tombstone. They say, the genius, the Kabbalist, the light of the exile, our teacher Asher Lemel. Obviously he was a Kabbalist. He was an honored Kabbalist. Here's another quote. Then to the rabbi of the Polish Jewish community in Krakow, at the end of the 15th century, Rabbi Asher Lemel was known as a Kabbalist. Kabbalists believe in their Kabbalah Bible, and their Kabbalistic Bible, Tikkunei Zohar. It's not going to be a surprise if these rabbis agree Yehovah is a sacred name. That's what Tikkunei Zohar teaches. Now here's a video clip of Nehemiah Gordon on Rabbi number 5. This is what it says in chapter 34 concerning the Tetragrammaton. Its vowels received from Sinai are Shva Cholam Kamatz. This is what it says in chapter 34 concerning the Tetragrammaton. Its vowels received from Sinai are Shva Cholam Kamatz. Again, this sounds very impressive. But can you see their tetragrammaton? I want to show you the Hebrew word that Nehemiah translates as tetragrammaton. And those three dots at the end, I want to show you what Nehemiah deleted there. Because in context, if you read this in context, it reads very differently. So here is an accurate translation. And we'll look at this in Hebrew just now. And this is what it says there in chapter 34. Know that the vowels of the name Adonai... What? Nehemiah said tetragrammaton. Know that the vowels of the name Adonai received from Sinai are Shua Cholom Kamets. And then 
he goes on, Rabbi 5 goes on to explain what he's talking about. He makes this very clear. Shwa under the Aleph. There's no Aleph in Yodei Wahei. There's an Aleph in Adonai. Cholim on the Dalet. Again, there's no Dalet in Yodei Wahei. Kamet's under the Nun. There's no Nun in the Tetragrammaton. Here it is in Hebrew. Da, Kinikud, Shem Adonai. Know that the pointing of the name Adonai, Hamekubalami Sinai, which is received from Sinai, who is Shva Cholam Kamet. Okay, can you see? Nehemiah translates Adonai as Tetragrammaton. How is that possible? Yes, Adonai is an acronym there, and so what it hints at is Ani Dibarti Neum Yodei Wahei. I have spoken, declares Yodei Wahei. And what this rabbi is hinting at is that they're putting Adonai's vows on the name. That's what he's hinting at. He specifies here um, Shva Tachat Aleph Cholam Al Hadalet Kametz Tachat Hanun Aleph Dalet Nun. Adonai. The Yod in Adonai doesn't have a vowel. Can you see how that Nehemiah misrepresents this rabbi completely? This rabbi says, Shwa Cholam Kamet, they're the vowels of Adonai. That's not a problem for Nehemiah Gordon. He can change it. He can change Adonai into Tetragrammaton and delete the following phrase there so that you think this rabbi says it's Yehovah. Now, I don't argue that rabbi number five believed that Yehovah would be a sacred name because he's a Kabbalist and you if you put Adonai's vows on the name of course that's a sacred name to the Kabbalists but that's not really what he's saying here what he's saying here is Shua Cholam Kamets are the vowels of Adonai Nehemiah completely misrepresents this rabbi okay rabbi number five was a Kabbalistic rabbi an honored Kabbalist and Nehemiah misrepresents what he says to make you think the name is Yehovah. Last rabbi for today. Anonymous book of what? Kabbalah. Oh, was this a Kabbalistic source? So, rabbi number five, Asher Lemo of Krakow, quotes this book. Asher Lemo of Krakow also brought proof that he found in a certain holy book of Kabbalah, and this is what it says, and then this quotation becomes Nehemiah's rabbi number six. Okay? This is what it says. The vows of the actual name, dot, 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 are with a servant at its head and a king over it in the middle and the ball of understanding vowel at its end, dot, dot, dot. May I just ask, what did Nehemiah delete there? Remember, this is part of rabbi number four's response to rabbi number three to refute Rebbe number three's supposed grammar. Remember the context here. They're arguing against Rebbe number three. What does this really say? Let me show you an accurate translation. It says the vowels of the name itself, the actual name, are the same as the name of Adonut, are the same as the name of Lordship, Adonai, with a servant at its head and a king over it in the middle and a bull with the vowel of insight at its end, then this rabbi continues, and do not err because of the patach at the beginning of the title, at the beginning of Adonai. For the servant, the shwa, is the root on both of them, except that this is a guttural letter, and it is an aleph. Can you see this rabbi is talking about the guttural letter? Now, let me just explain to you what he's saying. We've got Adonai, and we have the name. And Rabbi number six says, the pointing of the name is the same as the pointing of Adonai. And just don't be confused because we have a patach here. That stripe there is a patach next to the shwa. Don't be confused because of this patach. We've still got a shwa there, and we still have a shwa there. But this aleph here at the beginning of the title is a guttural letter. It takes a compound shwa. We've got the same vowels here. Nehemiah doesn't want you to know this. He doesn't show you this. Nehemiah teaches that these vowels are not the same. Now he finds a rabbi who disagrees with him and says they are the same. Oh, that's not a problem for Nehemiah Gordon. He's so honest he can change that. He changes it until it matches his preconceived ideas 
And this becomes proof that the name is Yehovah. Let's look at this in Hebrew. Nikud Shem Ha'etzem, the pointing of the name itself, Shaveh B'Shem Adanut, is equal to, or is equivalent to, or is the same as, the name of Adanut. Okay? And do not be confused, do not err, because the patach at the beginning of the title, for the servant, the shwa, is the root on both of them, except that this is a letter of the throat, it's a guttural letter, and it is an aleph. May I ask, why did Nehemiah Gordon not skip rabbi number six? I mean, you find a rabbi that you don't like and you don't agree with him, leave him alone. Why did Nehemiah have to take this rabbi, misrepresent what he said, and make this into supposed evidence that the name is Yehovah? Is this how desperately Nehemiah is looking for evidence? Does he have no solid evidence that he has to change what this rabbi says to turn this into evidence that the name is Yehovah? Okay, back to Nehemiah's slide here. My grandfather Asher of Krakow explained, dot dot dot, Shua is called servant, dot dot dot, Cholim is called king, Kamatz is called the ball of understanding. Can I show you what Nehemiah deleted there? Two names are mentioned, and they are the Tetragrammaton and the name of Adanut. They are the same in pointing. Nehemiah doesn't show you that. He just deletes it because he doesn't like it. With a servant at its head means the Aleph is pointed with Shua. Nehemiah deletes that part, the Aleph. He doesn't want you to know this is about Adonai, which is called servant. A king above it in the middle means the Dalet is put with Cholam, which is called king, and the bull with the vowel of insight at its end means the Nun is put with Kamets, which is called the bull of insight. There's no Aleph, Dalet, Nun, and Yodei, Wow, Hey. These are the vowels of Adonai. How is it that Nehemiah completely misrepresents this? Why? I thought Nehemiah is so honest, so trustworthy. He's committed to the truth. Why does he change this? Okay, here it is in Hebrew. We'll just look at some phrases here. Um, hem shavim benikudam. They are the same and they're pointing. And it spells out the Aleph, Dalet, Nun. They're not talking about the name so much. They're really arguing about Adonai. Are Shua Cholom Kamets Adonai's vowels? Yes or no? These rabbis, rabbis number four, five, and six, they're telling us, Shua Cholom Kamets are Adonai's vowels. Those are the vowels you put on the name. And of course, that's a sacred name to the Kabbalists. This doesn't prove the original name is Yehovah. So, shockingly, all six, the first six rabbis, the earliest six rabbis here, are Kabbalistic rabbis. And they base their thinking on their Kabbalistic Bible, the fraudulent blasphemous Tikkunay Zohar. And now this becomes evidence that the name is Yehovah? What kind of evidence is this? I thought we're trying to get away from mystic sources, occult sources, pagan sources. Wow. All of this traces back to Tikkunay Zohar, the Bible of the Kabbalists. Now, let's sum up what did we learn today. Nehemiah Gordon says, if it's not in the Old Testament, I can't use it. Yet Nehemiah uses the ten rabbis as proof. Does Nehemiah not know that these ten rabbis are not in the Tanakh? Or what? Nehemiah does use sources that are not in the Tanakh. He frequently and constantly refers to these sources. So, then what does it mean if Nehemiah says, if it's not in the Old Testament, I can't use it? Is that maybe Nehemiah's official announcement saying, I will not believe in Yeshua? 
because that's how he applies it. He doesn't believe in Yeshua, yet he uses other sources that are not in the Tanakh. Nehemiah Gordon rejects rabbinical authority, and he states that one Bible manuscript means more than a million rabbis. All known Bible manuscripts, including the best manuscripts in the world, disprove the ten rabbis. The manuscripts say Yehovah is a gibberish name. So, how could Nehemiah use these ten rabbis as proof? If these rabbis say Yehovah is a sacred name, they are contradicting all the evidence in the Hebrew Bible manuscripts. Is this ignorance or is this dishonesty? Furthermore, the Zohar is the earliest of the ten rabbis. Around the year 1300, Nehemiah says. Now, why is that important? Most people who bring Greek sources or pagan sources or occult or magical sources to say the name is this or that or the other will quote sources from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th centuries. Nehemiah brings rabbis from the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries and so on, more than a thousand years later, and these are still not kosher Jewish sources. The Zohar uses Chashak both for Yehovi and Yehovah. It doesn't give you one correct pronunciation, it gives you multiple pronunciations. Yehovah is, uh, Yehovi is associated with righteousness, but Yehovah is associated with power and wisdom in the Zohar. And Nehemiah seems to go along with this by saying, oh, this passage in the Zohar is so powerful. The Zohar is a fraudulent, blasphemous, occult book based on imagination. Yet many rabbis accepted this Zohar as their Kabbalistic Bible, and the first six rabbis were all Kabbalistic. That means they all based their thinking on their Kabbalistic Bible. That's why they agree. They don't agree with the Tanakh. They don't agree with the Bible manuscripts, but they agree with their Kabbalistic Bible, the Zohar. Nehemiah says pagan sources versus Jewish sources. Nehemiah makes everyone think that when they look at these rabbis, these 10 or 16 rabbis, they're looking at kosher Jewish sources. We're getting away from paganism, occultism, mysticism, magic, and so on. That's what Nehemiah makes everyone think. The first six rabbis trace back to Kabbalism. They were all Kabbalistic rabbis. And so, if you want to call this authentic, you'll have to say this is authentic Jewish paganism. Kabbalah is about occultism and mysticism and magic. Kabbalah is pagan. So these are authentic Jewish pagan sources. Rabbis 5 and 6 are completely misrepresented. Nehemiah completely changed what they said to make you think that the name is Yehovah. Nehemiah added, he took away, he twisted it, to shed light on it supposedly. That's what the Kabbalists do. Nehemiah acted like a Kabbalist in what he did to Rabbis 5 and 6. Is this ignorance or is this another bald-faced lie? Did Nehemiah never read what Rabbis 5 and 6 actually said? Or is he purposefully misrepresenting this to you to make you think that he is right? What is the problem? Okay, I hope you found this interesting today. In the next session, in part B, we want to cover the other ten rabbis. Why did these other rabbis agree? Why did they say Yehovah is a sacred name? Were some of these other rabbis Kabbalists too? And how about the vowel points? I want to show you how that the Zohar claims that the vowel points originated with Moses. And that is part of this big confusion. If Moses wrote Yehovah and Yehovah, then of course those are sacred names, and they don't understand that these vowel points simply record the traditional reading, reading the name as Adonai and Elohim. 
Okay, until next time, Shalom in Yeshua Mashiach.